Want to expand the influence of design? Pragmatic Institute offers interactive, actionable courses for designers who are looking to contribute more strategically in their organizations. Explore our offerings such as business strategy and design and influence through storytelling at pragmaticinstitute.com slash design. And welcome to Design Chats, a podcast from Pragmatic Institute, where we sit down with design leaders, practitioners, and alumni to discuss how to grow the strategic impact of design. I am Rebecca Kelliger, Vice President of Marketing and Product Strategy at Pragmatic Institute. And today I'm extremely excited to have on Kate Goodale, who's the head of UX Addressed and author of Thrifted Design Leadership Blog, which you should totally check out because I have, and there's some great stuff on there. Welcome, Kate. Hey, I'm so glad to be here. And you made me sound very impressive with the intro. So (laughs) now it's up to you from here, Kate. (laughs) No pressure. (laughs) You know, know, this will be great. We have lots of good things to talk about. But for some people maybe who aren't familiar with you and your work and your writing, give us a little bit about the, the Kate background, right? How you got into design and why you're so passionate about it. Sure. So I have been in design my whole career, but really started from graphic design. And now we're here. I actually have always worked between the interface between fashion and games and the product design world and the game design world. So everything that exists in that juicy space between industries, that's my thing. (laughs) So that's led me from places like Microsoft, where I worked on some augmented reality stuff, through to King, the mobile games people, mainly known for all of our addictions, Candy Crush. Um, (laughs) So I worked on that for a while some stuff for language learning. And yeah, now now I'm here working on fashion games, kind of wild, wild west. <laughs> and I think, I think for everybody listening or for a lot of people listening, the idea of game UX is both super, it just sounds super cool <laughs> uh, and intriguing, but also maybe it's like a little bit of a mystery, right? Like what exactly does that mean? So let's talk a little bit about that. Like how does UX work in a game company? Great question, because I think the games industry is always trying to figure that out as well. (laughs) It's definitely evolved over time. And I think for me, as someone who's gone back and forth between the more like traditional tech industry and the games industry, it's been really interesting to see kind of what's been learned between the two of them. In a games company or Actually, no, let's let's start. In in a lot of product teams, you as the product or UX designer actually have a lot of leadership kind of immediately in terms of product strategy and direction and kind of working directly with your product owner or the engineering manager and figuring out what that should be, what that looks like and, and how you're going to build it. Whereas with any piece of entertainment, kind of like if you're working on a film or a TV show as well, games have all of these other creatives mm. and, and people who have some sort of vision or design vision that you need to collaborate with and get the best out of. And I find that UX often becomes very much a glue role, kind of finding the way between you know what's possible in engineering what game design think would be just this really cool, fun little feature. And then, of course, what users actually think and how they feel and how they will act with that product. Well, yeah, I can see that. Anytime, like you said, whether it's a choir or a movie or a game, when you've got a lot of creative people with very clear ideas, mm-hmm. making them sing together and making everyone be, feel a part, it takes an extra amount of effort. And I, and I think it's really interesting that that's a role of alignment that UX plays in the game company. Hmm. And I think the games industry definitely lagged behind for a while when it came to what the responsibilities of UX and user interface, which I'm sure is a discussion you've had with previous people on the podcast too, right? And what what that overlap is between visual design, interaction design, experience design, and user research, right? And how you make sure those things are actually both like represented at a leadership level and also respected for their differences, but also their crossovers. So in games, I think so many, you know, back in the day, even before my time, (laughs) um, a lot of the kind of UX design might have been done by a game designer. So someone who might not have had any kind of real experience in like human factors, ergonomics, usability, but they have a really good vision for what they want in the product. Traditionally, they would like 
make a wireframe and throw it over the fence to whoever was the most unlucky game artist for that day. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like the unluckiest game artist would just have to kind of draw an interface on top of that. And we know, right, that like obviously things have moved on. And, and luckily, again, games as a whole has kind of moved towards much more of a user-centered product design way of working. But yeah, like because of all of those different inputs and that history, it makes for quite a unique situation for, for building brilliant experiences. And I think you talk about too, that not only were like that major evolution, but it's in a space where, and I think we see this in, in all areas of design as well, that just, it continually evolves the roles mm -hmm. and the titles and who's doing what. Yeah, totally. I mean, I remember I probably had a lot of discussions on Twitter about this, <laughs> but like for, for us, I find that sometimes in a big games company, if you join, you know, you are going to be actually, no, let's say in a product design company and a lot of especially startups, especially here in like the kind of UK London startup scene, you might be like two or three product designers or UX designers and you're doing everything. Most of you tend to be, people tend to be very T-shaped, doing everything from kind of early phase research, concepting, product planning and strategy with the product team, but then also taking that through, you know, building in Figma, low fidelity, wireframing, prototyping, and then working that all the way up to high fidelity and kind of either passing it off to user research or actually conducting a lot of user research yourself. It's really common to be that person. And in a games company, you might be kind of one interaction VFX UI designer. <laughs> like there, there are actually, especially for really big games, mm. there are people who just make, you know, the explosion that comes out when you click on a card in Hearthstone <laughs> or someone who actually only works on like UI implementation or someone who only works on facilitating, you know, user research where you have 40 contestants playing an MMO together in the same space. And of course, there are incredibly complex situations like that in, in other tech companies as well. But yeah, there's like a real, sometimes the roles can be a lot more specific, mm -hmm. I would say, in the games industry, or they kind of call for a skill set that might not be expected of a UX designer, especially kind of in that more traditional tech world. However, there is a lot of crossover. There's, there's definitely right. ways that people can cross back and forth. So there's like a lot of depth in the roles versus width. It depends, like definitely for some of them, but I would also say, and this is why it kind of comes to titles, right? Because the team I've been managing for the last few years, everyone is a UI slash UX designer, which I know is a title that has come under fire a lot. It's a very controversial <laughs> title, right? But us being a mobile games company, the cycles of iteration are so rapid. And actually the a lot of the standards and the expectations that we would be working with, they kind of come directly from that startup product design world in which people are expected to be kind of end to end. So what I personally feel now is like they're absolutely, you know, agree they are different skill sets and they they all need their respect and, and their place in a business. But I would say a lot of the times in these kind of mobile games companies, you tend to get people who are more generalists and maybe kind of T-shaped, like a generalist who could do a bit of everything within that gamut, but they might be a specialist in VFX, for example, mm -hmm, or a specialist mm -hmm. in prototyping, which is which is kind of my specialism. And yeah, it's those bigger companies. If any of the listeners have ever played a Nintendo game or, you know, their Assassin's Creed or those sort of things. I mean, those sort of games are made by teams of thousands of people, mm. like 2000 people probably wow. working on the next Assassin's Creed game. So yeah, in a team that size, you have space for your, you know, specialist in rendering really high fidelity icons <laughs> but that's actually a pretty common like specialist job okay no and I, mean, I think you probably see that even outside like the more the larger the design team and to some place uh, extent the more established or more design focused the organization is then you're going to get mm. wider uh, a bigger team and then you have space for that but there is absolutely the reality of the worlds where we are wearing multiple hats okay. there's plenty of places like that as well <laughs> yeah i can imagine so we talked about some of the differences. What does that look like, like on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm, good question. Because I would say like having, again, gone back and forth between the two, um, mm -hmm. there's more similarities and differences. And I would say for anyone, you know, we, we talked about it a bit, but like for anyone who's thought they might be interested in working in a game space, more than ever, there is crossover of people coming from tech and products, working in games, and maybe bringing some of that skill set and that learning back to more creative product design or like kind of the area of, of tech they want to work in. So 
don't feel intimidated that it seems like it might be quite different. <laughs> because yeah, the day to day is very similar. I really believe and I hire, you know, I've done a lot of hiring over the last few years. And I really hired from both pure mm. UX backgrounds and actually from people who have more of that graphic design art background and actually less of a UX specialism. Because I really believe like UX design and being competent at that is about the core understanding of user needs and behaviors and that core level of empathy and kind of humility, right? Understanding that you are not the player and you're not the user and the people that you're making something for might have very different needs and wants than you, but that your craft is the thing that will allow them to enjoy that product. And that is something that, you know, again, probably spoken about before, like, everyone can be user-centered in an organization, you know, that that's actually when you get design maturity in a business, when you have your engineers considering, again, usability factors, and they're the ones bringing up, well, actually, you know, do we need to think about the text size here? Or could we add this in to like open this up to a whole new raft of users? But to kind of get back to the main point, the, the, the core competencies are the same or very similar. It's about understanding all of that underpinning psychology and usually good communication skills though i would say kind of like before sometimes you're going to have to communicate with kind of different people than you'd expect mm -hmm. so figuring out like game designers are the wildest wackiest people you'll ever meet <laughs> and i if you can find a game designer and speak to them i think you should because they tend to be people who have amazing pie in the sky ideas okay there's two types of game designer ones that have amazing pie in the sky ideas that kind of they need someone to pull on the string of the balloon right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like the in that situation you have the game designer ux designer kind of feedback loop where they will say oh but wouldn't it be awesome if you could write on a dinosaur here and you as the ux designer kind of tend to come in and say okay well like how would you imagine that feeling like what what's the feeling for the player why are they doing this? How does it tie back to our broader business goals like or this other thing that we've built or these systems? you build a prototype or do some sketches, like you kind of become the translation device for that game designer, prototype it, and you work together to see, they realize, oh, actually, that wasn't what I was feeling. You can kind of actually use a UX designer in that situation or trying to figure out what they meant by that. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> very often the game designer actually wants like, oh, but I, I, I just want there to be a really exciting moment here. And so actually UX can kind of go and say, well, there's other ways that we can do that through our craft. You know, whether, it, you know, you want the feedback to be better. Okay, well, actually we can look at our UI animation or we can look at sound effects, right? Mm. And, and all of those, those other elements that create a holistic experience. Or you can, they, they'll figure out they didn't want that. The second type of game designer <laughs> tends to be super systems focused and almost, so I've actually met game designers who started as economists and it's becoming oh. more and more common. Yeah, these really data-driven game designers. And for those people, you're actually sitting there as a, you're kind of a creative enabler <laughs> because those, those sort of game designers tend to be more like, yeah, well, these are the numbers we need to get, or this is the, this is the thing I really feel like needs to be the focus here. And then as a UX designer, you tend to be leaning more on your creative side hmm. with like, oh, well, as a way we could do this, maybe an exciting animation or a really nice piece of feedback, or do we like call back to what the player has already done at this point or this flow or this system. And you're almost like kind of bringing them out of their shell when it comes to what could be kind of through the medium of user experience. So, so yeah, it's, it's really exciting. <laughs> it's two very different. And one of the things yeah. you talked about there, you, you talked about data driven. And one of the things that, that, you know, at Pragmatic, we're sort of, we, we teach product managers, we teach data individuals and we teach designers, right? So we're always thinking about the intersection. But one of the things I found really interesting in talking to you before before was just how much metrics and data focus as a designer and your design team is. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Our design team actually did a like pop quiz on all of the acronyms that we used for metrics. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Last week. There are so and many. I, I know. <laughs> and I didn't win, unfortunately. Oh. So. <laughs> but yeah, and I, I think in some ways, this is kind of a specialism of the mobile games industry, but we, in, I think a lot of people think of video games and they think, oh, it's like a fun thing. And there's like a creative auteur at the top of it. who's just like deciding what it's going to be like. And then everyone else just kind of plays along with it and finds out 
what's going to be. And very in some situations, that will be the case. But especially these days, we are actually, I would say it's more common to be constantly releasing things, getting both qualitative and quantitative data, iterating on that, feeding back on it and iterating on it. It has to be such a tight loop because of kind of number one, the market conditions. One of the main things that game designers and UX designers will often be looking at, as boring as it sounds, is the like cost per acquisition. Because we have this this retention funnel and you again, many, many, many people working in that tech space will be used to it, right? Your D1 retention, your D7 retention, D30 retention. And that is you know, if, if you're signing up for a bank, <laughs> that you just want that to be as smooth as possible. You want to re- re- basically remove any piece of friction. Maybe actually, maybe not a bank. That's a bad example. If you're going to sign up for a language learning app, which is what I used to work on, right? Language learning app. You want to make that smooth and as easy and as encouraging as possible because you don't want to put any blocks in the way of people mm-hmm. progressing, right? You want to get them as far through their process and kind of into being a payer as quickly as possible. We all know that people are, we have, oh, what's it called? Now I forget. If we invest more time in things, we are more likely to stick to them. So right. the longer like a stickiness. Get, yep. Yes, a stickiness, exactly. However, if we made a game as easy as possible and as smooth as possible, people would not play it because it would be boring. Yep. Because the whole point of them coming there is not to learn a language or to be a person who can put their money into the bank or to do things. It's to be in that game experience. And I think that's that fundamental difference means that we have to look at our metrics in a different way and track different things. Because when I was actually on one of the pragmatic courses, we were discussing NPS mm-hmm. and like times and kind of combined with, you know, time spent in app. And that is something for games where you actually might get different, you might be targeting different things traditionally. Because one of the women I was speaking with was saying that they got their time and app really low because they got users to get through, get what they wanted done, and then it was done and they were able to move on with their day. And very often you might actually be aiming for that, right? You want mm-hmm. the, the your app or your product or your software to be such a small part that it feels natural to someone. For us, we're often and quite often looking for longer session length, but then we end up balancing that against if someone is likely to monetize or you know at, at what points they will drop off so it's yeah it's it's very data driven and i would say like a lot most of this the game studios i've worked in will actually have boards up on the wall with live tracking data of like how retention is tracking and especially like when you release a new feature you will see on that board okay well there's x thousand people live in it right now and this percentage are monetizing and you know this percentage are dropping off and even like at what you know at what gameplay moment are they dropping off which is very exciting as a designer because you can kind of extrapolate from that like oh well maybe that's too frustrating maybe we didn't communicate that clearly enough yeah but it's uh it's exciting it's such an interesting balance when you think about games too and we can all think of the games we've played like you said, it needs to be challenging enough that you feel a sense of accomplishment when you've mm. succeeded. And so that it's like, it stimulates you. But there are times like as you progress up the levels <laughs> that you can get to an, a point where you feel like it's too challenging, where it's frustrating, yeah. right? And so you go back and you, you that was the games you start playing. So you're constantly <laughs> trying to get people in their happy zone. And mm. that happy zone would be very different for different people. Oh, Do you guys so segment at all types of users? I would imagine. Yeah. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. And I think there's there's segmentation in games is basically its own discipline. And again, mm-hmm, this is mm-hmm. this is one of the things where you get to I would say like the data science and like marketing and consumer targeting and planning of games is is such a huge user acquisition in games is is really a, a massive discipline on its own, which I am not as experienced in. <laughs> I just make the nice buttons. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, I think it's, it also all comes down to, and this is, this is relevant kind of in every studio that I've worked at. It all comes down to as design leadership to pull it back to that balancing and teaching the studio how to balance quantitative and qualitative data and to to triangulate those to actually come up with user insights. What we find, again, like traditionally with segmentation and with A-B testing or A-B-C, whatever testing, 
incredibly popular in games, of course. With A-B testing, you often find, obviously, that you can't have, you won't be able to segment until you have X amount of users, right? Until mm-hmm. you've reached statistical significance on the work that you're doing. And I think that also, that leads a lot of games developers to struggle because they mm-hmm. say, well, it's not statistically significant, so we can't kind of pull everything out of it. And that's actually the point where you... Of course, in a big game and once you've released something and you've kind of built up that player base and that consumer base, it's very easy to uh, to go and segment. And that, again, becomes becomes a full time job. But I think especially early on in the development cycle, that's then part of the responsibility of design leadership to say, okay, you know, we're not going to segment yet because we don't we don't we don't have enough users to give us that real data, but we can get 80 percent out of the insights let's say, from doing some really in-depth user research on potential customers, target audiences, and focus groups and testing, and then one-on-one moderated, unmoderated tests. A lot of ethnographic research is done in games these days as well. So actually Mm. looking at players' behavior patterns with games over time, as opposed to those kind of simple D1, D2 retention metrics actually look at well when does this person play and how do they play Mm. you know are the people we think are going to be our target audience because you know always starts with an assumption there's always an assumption hypothesis right yeah (laughs) you know like we hypothesize our audience is going to be moms in the midwest (laughs) a common candidate for casual mobile games we think it's going to be moms in the midwest of you know around about this salary bracket, around about this age, around about this background, whatever. When you actually sit with those people and do that in-depth ethnographic research to find out, okay, well, you know, do they have their phone beside them? Is their main gaming time before they go to bed, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a, oh, I've like, I just put the kids to bed or I've just sent them off to school. This is my like 20 minutes to relax my own before I get around to doing everything in my day. And then how does that differ to, you know, another segment, the you know, guy who is commuting to his like part-time job every day because like, and yeah, again, you'll have more expert experts on ethnographic research speaking here, (laughs) I'm sure. But I think there's so many fascinating things to be found there for when it comes to an entertainment product. Because, you know, again, if you're building your your banking app or whatever, those people will have different needs, Mm -hmm. but as long as they can get that payment done or they can, you know, they can they can do what they need to do that's fine those people are going to be very differently engaged with the same video game in the same time space you know they might have one hand or two hands available <laughs> they might have internet connection or not yeah and i think these things that like actual in situ user research is all the more valuable when it comes to entertainment products cuz also you know if my banking app isn't working it's good. there's a lot of friction for me to be able to go and change banks but if a game's not working, there's thousands of others that are free on yep. the app store. Why and should we, I keep playing? Yeah. And we've all done that, right? Where we had a yeah. game we love and then, you know, it's done. Yeah, yeah it's done. Now. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about friction, because I think this is another really interesting area with game design, right? I mean, when you think about your bank app, you are trying to eliminate all friction and it's super pure usability focus. And it's a little bit different with game design. <laughs> Quite, yeah. Very. And, and I think that... The job of UX in games tend to be like balancing that friction point. I like to say that it's making the easy things easy and the hard things hard. We actually often spend a lot of time designing things in games and then realizing that players speed through them (laughs) in no time at all. And they don't actually get to appreciate them. And, you know, games also, all games, well, most games include the things traditionally we would be working on as UX designers, you know, mainly some sort of user interface, some sort of way that the player enters data. There's usually some sort of form. There's actually a lot of spreadsheets in the back of every video game that you're playing. (laughs) It's all going into a CSV somewhere. So there's actually a lot of the things traditionally we would be designing for, whether it's task completion, feedback when a user has taken an action. But also most games include things that are not what most of the interfaces that we're designing for you know actually Mm -hmm. ux designer i might be involved when okay my character swings the sword at 
this goblin it's always a goblin <laughs> so, <laughs> goblins and dragons <laughs> <laughs> take your pick so they swing the sword at the goblin and we're getting from user testing that people don't feel like the people don't feel they don't recognize that they got loot from the goblin how do we change that and of course there's like there's a traditional question there of like okay well what's the feedback and how does that you know tie into everything else that we've done but there's Kind of all the things I mentioned previously around audio and the visual aspect and motion. And where this ties to friction is like, we also have to ask that extra question of not should should we be able to see what loot we got from the goblin? <laughs> but actually, like, is that the thing that we want the player to be confused by? Because mm. maybe it is. Maybe actually what is keeping people in the game. This doesn't sound like a very fun game, but maybe what's keeping people in the game or, or what is the kind of difficulty is trying to plan out, oh, well, I got this loot here, so I'm going to use it for this thing. Or like, if I get, if I kill five goblins a minute, I know that I'm going to have enough of these stats to do this thing. In again, sounds like a terrible game, but perhaps in a game like that, you actually wouldn't want it to be massively clear. You'd want the player to be searching around. A great example is a hidden object game, you know. Mm. So one of these games where they were really popular in the 90s and now they're really popular again. So I, I appreciate that as a, as a 90s gamer. <laughs> but it would usually be like a painted scene and you would have to click around and find out what, what was wrong and apply objects to each other. That's a really traditional one where you might say, oh, players aren't able to find things. <laughs> How do you solve that as UX? Because actually the point of the game is that players mm -hmm. can't find things. So very often we, and I think that's again why it's so important that UX needs to be involved and really knowledgeable about both product strategy and like product vision and, and what those metrics are and those goals are, but also the kind of company strategy, game design vision. We're kind of that mix between the two because we will often come into those conversations with, okay, you know, we're getting from user research or we're getting from player feedback that it's really difficult to see what is the next thing to click on. Is what we need to do an A-B test where we put a big bright white outline around it or something like that? And actually then taking that, you know, basically creating less friction, right? Making the difficult, difficult part easier through reducing friction through kind of user experience design principles or you know is it that like your controller vibrates when you put the joystick over it or something right do you give some haptic feedback towards reducing the friction but that that's where it comes back to our earlier discussion about metrics because we would then be needing to say okay well we've done our job as mm -hmm. UX design you know if let's say user testing comes back and like five out of five everyone managed to complete the task that's where actually we need to make sure that we're not making assumptions too early and actually looking at that data that comes back to say, yep, that's great. You know, it's increased our retention because more people are getting through, let's say, the tutorial that this was in and they actually understand how to recognize what's the hidden object thing. Or actually, oh no, you know, maybe people have got through the tutorial and they immediately drop off because the rest of the game is too difficult now. Or they just found it boring. They realized it just made everything too easy. Again, mm -hmm. their assumption, they made it too easy, so there's no point for them to play because they're not hooked. So yeah, so it's always that really difficult balance and not to keep rambling on, but like we, I, I love the flow state theory that was created about kind of that balance between difficulty and skill and finding that, mid mm. that midpoint between it, I think is always what we're trying to do with our friction design. Right. And it, it's just not the case in a lot of, of design that we think in app design. You're like, nope, I don't ever want it to be friction, but it's such an important part of what makes a game great or not. Right. Totally. So one of the other reasons I wanted to have you on, not just because you're just a delightful to talk to, uh, <laughs> but I think it's interesting, you know, we talk a lot about game design, but I think one of the things you talk about in your blog too, is that this has impact and influence on how you design in general, because mm. today's market is gamers right? In a different way, you know, there were some in the 80s and 90s, but the proclivity and the widespreadness, mm -hmm. not quite a word, but uh, <laughs> that of the, today <laughs> means that no matter what you're designing, remembering that your audience is gamers. And so I just think that's super interesting. Tell me a little bit more about that. Oh, totally. So as someone that's been, so I've been working directly in the games industry for 
almost exactly 11 years, which is wild. <laughs> and I think I've seen a massive shift. I hate to say pre and post COVID, but that's pretty much it of if people will actually be willing to identify themselves as a gamer, mm. even up until let's, let's say like 20. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like 2015, 2016, we were seeing this massive boom of things like Candy Crush, mobile games. Everyone was, you know, if you're, if you're on the subway or you're on the tube here in London, you would see absolutely everyone with like the new mobile game on their phone every day, right? That was what you did. But at the same time, no one called themselves a gamer. It was kind of this secret thing of like, oh yeah, that's a thing. That's just like a, an app I use. It's just another app. You know, it's, it's like, you almost don't want to be associated with, mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. Teenage boys in their bedrooms screaming, <laughs> screaming, screaming insanity to each other. And I think one of the like one of the big side effects to come out of the, the global pandemic we've kind of just been through is we're all stuck at home. And I think people realized, oh, you can have fun in games that is not being on the subway and just playing something kind of mindless or screaming at other 13-year-olds. Like there are there's such a breadth of enjoyable, engaging entertainment experiences. And I think that that kind of not only allowed the more general public to kind of open themselves up to playing things that are not just Candy Crush, but it, I think it also meant that, so, I mean, we, we saw in the stats just this massive explosion of people who are not only playing games, but also hanging out in game worlds, using software like Discord, really popular, a lot more people watching things like Twitch, like watching other people play games and kind of becoming immersed in that gamer culture without feeling like they have to fit one of those stereotypes. Where this has really interesting implications for design as a whole is we all know that as people start to use products, their expectations for how products work will shift and change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as what's a great example is the iPhone, you know, like it or <laughs> love it or hate it, I got fully bought into the Apple ecosystem a few years ago and I, I can never go back, I don't think, unfortunately. They've got me. <laughs> um, but like we had, you know, touch screen technology before the iPhone. That had existed for a long time. The original iPhone popularized it, obviously made it much more user-friendly and much more accessible to the consumer market. And that irrevocably changed how people interact with products. You know, we saw, like, if you look at examples of how other pieces of software designed their icons, where they put their home bar, what a swipe up from the bottom of a screen means, what the size of a touch target should be, like how copying and pasting text, although to be fair, that was taken from what was happening in Android at the time. But like all of these things that we would now do without thinking about it, those came from a revolution in the sort of technology that was being used and the fact that people were just using it anyway. So they kind of just have to learn it. I don't know if any of the listeners or yourself have ever, like if you know any kind of two to three year olds, like kids that kids that kind of grew up entirely on, on iPads, a lot of them, there, there was a big news story in the UK a few months ago of kids going to school for the first time and trying to swipe a book <laughs> because, because they're used they're used to that interaction pattern right of like swiping things on an ipad for it to move and i i don't think that's like the death of humanity as, as some people i think are internet pundits would claim but it just shows basically that those patterns that we learn and we practice every day those come through into everything else we use that is my long-winded way of saying the fact that we are all playing games and it's become more socially acceptable and normal to play games means that those patterns we're experiencing in video games, whether it's getting a reward for doing a quest, whether it's having text box style tutorials popping up, whether it's kind of the feeling of kind of collaborative multiplayer being like natively within a game mm, or within mm -hmm. an experience, those are starting to be expected and kind of they're common patterns that people are understanding across all the other apps and services and software they're using. And so that's why it's important. Sorry, I just rambled massively there. No, I think, but so that's exactly it, right? I mean, it really is that there's things like I, I didn't even think about, like the multiplayer aspect of it that's mm. so, you know, taken for granted in games and you see it in little, but like really shaping the way people work together, especially as we work remote, right? Mm. Or uh, gamification of things when people are like getting rewards and seeing that it goes from, from, yes, I get it to an expectation and a real understanding of, 
of how it should make me feel, which means my expect, right? Like I have a expectation around it that, that I'm looking for companies to deliver on. Yeah, that, that that's, you hit the nail on the head. Cause I, I think in pre, pre the popularity of games, we were kind of okay if our products just worked. Like mm-hmm. as long as it works and it gets it done, that's fine. What we are now seeing is the apps and services that are really excelling in the market and pulling market share are things that have those novel, delightful experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just having a nice animation on a button when you click it or having that like satisfying sound or a really kind of holistic design language across it. But if you look at anything that's become really popular, at least at least in the UK, the things that are setting themselves above and beyond are the things that are giving those kind of crafted, personalized experiences that it's not just games that do this, but it's it's something that as games UX designers is the core way in which we're trying to make these engaging experiences. It's true. And we think about, we're talking about segmentation from gaming mm. uh, and something we talk about in general, but that personalization based mm. on where I am in my journey, how familiar I am with whatever your app is, all of those things are absolutely an expectation, right? That mm. unlocks more as we go along. So mm. you are blazing yeah. paths for all kinds yeah. of industries, Kate. Yeah, <laughs> we, I, we have a really interesting, something I worked on when I was at King, actually. And it's definitely, again, it's become its own set of patterns, which is re-onboarding, right? Mm-hmm. And like, how do you, and you, you mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes you'll be playing a game and it just gets too hard and you drop off. You're like, uh, I can't put the time to it, right? We realized, and a lot of companies have realized that quite often people, they might come back a week later or a month later and be like, oh, I I actually liked playing that thing. I'll do it. And they get back in and it's it's at exactly the same difficulty level as it was Mm. when they left. And it's almost this, it's this cliff, you know, when you want to be doing something. And you find that often in mobile games where we tend to have a lot of like time-based stuff. You know, there's, there's an event going on now and there's this thing happening and you come back a few months later and you've lost all your progress and you know you you're like what well, you know you feel like you're kind of stuck in the middle of nothing so there's actually a bunch of specific patterns that have been developed by games companies for re-onboarding as mm-hmm. we would call it so like how do we really incentivize the player and kind of show off all that's best about what's changed since they left and it is that it's that personalization of experience and understanding that people need that ramp when they're coming back and I think for, you know, again, when the kind of app development industry was really first kicking off about 10 years ago or so, there wasn't that long-term thinking about users. It's like, if we can keep people for a year, that's fantastic. And especially games would, would work like that. It's like a mm-hmm. six-month cycle. Of like, okay, you know, do a few feature updates for six to 10 months after the game is released, and then we'll move on to the next one. Now, games are built with five to 10-year life cycles oh, in well. mind. Yeah. And yeah, and then like, Again, to come back to the the product design side of it, I've seen other apps that I used to use downloading them and they're starting to pull in these patterns of like, actually, you know, looks what's great now. Let's get you back up to speed on the stuff that you've missed or, you know, do you want to try this again? And I think it just, it makes it feel so personalized and I think it really helps with, with user engagement. Otherwise they wouldn't do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we talked about a lot of different things, Kate. If you were going to have listeners do two things differently tomorrow based on what we talked about today, it's my big stumping question. Uh, what would it be? Two things. Great question. So I think this one's kind of generic, but I think it will be applicable to everyone, which is really step back and reconsider how design work ties into the vision of your product. I think very often we can get caught in the weeds, even if you're in product leadership, right? You can get caught in the day-to-day of like, we've got to deliver this feature and we've got to, you know, make sure that this thing works and work with engineering to create amazing, engaging, innovative game UX experiences. We need to make sure every single thing that we are building ties back to that broader vision. And, you know, sometimes it's saying, actually, no, we don't want to be riding on the back of a dinosaur because, you know, at this point, they're just coming down off of this emotional high. (laughs) And we need to make sure it's as smooth as possible because we think that might be a turn point. And sometimes it's actually pushing for certain things. Like, we really need this accessibility feature because 
that's part of the vision for this part of the product, or we really think that that's going to be part of the segmentation. So we need to push for it here. The second thing would be, the second thing is probably much more expected, but that is to go and play a game and to really look at it from a UX perspective. I know all of us who have ever designed software or apps, once you have done that, you can never look at them in the same way again (laughs) because you'll be like, oh, they've not updated their backend here. They're not using... (laughs) They're using an old iOS pattern for how you choose a date. God, why are they doing that? I, I'm that person, but I'm not very fun at dinner parties. Um, <laughs> You're um, not the person to invite for a gamer night. That's where we're <laughs> maybe hearing. Like, this is like, I imagine even if the audience listening don't consider themselves gamers, all of you will play one game at least, probably. If you don't, tell me about it. And you're a very rare, very rare sort of person. That game could be, I mean, I've been obsessed with the New York Times Crossword app because it's actually really well designed. It's got really good feedback. It's obviously a very traditional game, but it takes a lot, again, a lot of those patterns from the games industry and applies them to kind of more old school style of game. Have a bit of an analysis that you might do, you know, kind of heuristic analysis, competitor analysis, and try and analyze the ways in which they've created that feedback feeling. Just again, just just thinking about crosswords, I was doing a lot of them yesterday. There's a really lovely pattern in the New York Times crossword app where when it will give you a little kind of just a little pop up on screen, a tiny little one when you've got half the way through the puzzle and two thirds of the way through the puzzle or three quarters with a tiny little animation, just a little pop. It's very much within their design pattern. Mm, mm. It's just that little, oh, like a little boost. Like, yeah, oh, a little oh. satisfying. Like, don't give up yet. Look how yeah. far you've come. Good job. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a really great example where, and of course it is a game, but it's, you you know, to, to take inspiration from games, you don't have to, you know, make everything look like it's made out of candy and like take all of your UI designers back and make them work in Illustrator and painting <laughs> things. But you can take some of those patterns into kind of whatever you're building if you're trying to make an engaging experiences, which I think we all are, you know. Yeah. Even if we're making banking apps. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And there's so many like lessons there. There's the like it's not in games and in the puzzle, it's not all about the end result. Mm. Right? There is is finding ways to celebrate and give reinforcement along the way mm. that I think uh, is a is a great thing for us all to remember as well. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Kate, this has been a super fun talking to you. Thanks for coming in, sharing your ideas, your stories. Uh, Tell us a little bit, like if people want to, if people want to know more from Kate, where should they go? (laughs) So probably the best place to see me now that Twitter is in its death spirals um, (laughs) (laughs) would be my blog, uh, which Rebecca mentioned at the start, which is designcaitlin.substack.com. Luckily, there aren't very many Kate Goodales in the world. Mm. So if you search that, you'll probably find me. And yeah, I'm going to be posting a lot there because I'm actually taking a career break um, as of as of the end of March. So I'm going to be writing a lot and talking about design as I kind of figure out what, what the future looks like for product and UX and games and how they fit together. So then that's in any way interest to you, get me there. We'll chat. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it'll be super fun to to watch your journey there. So, all right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Kate, for coming on. I really appreciated it. Thank you for having me. All right. See you later. All right. That does it for today's episode. Uh, don't forget, if you're looking to learn more about how to contribute strategically, drive value, build influence in your organization, don't forget to check out pragmaticinstitute.com slash design. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.